This is Father Bonaventure Chaplin. And this is Father Gregory Pine. And welcome to God's Splaining. Please like, subscribe, share reviews on our platforms of social media. Oof, genitive construction there. <laughs> Uh, wherever you do consume your podcasts, and uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Father Gregory, who knows how to talk. <laughs> Father Gregory, we are here again. Oh yeah, here for we the are. second time. We're crushing it for for a thing. Columbus, Ohio, doing yeah. a thing. Yeah, so, we're, yeah, we're in Columbus, Ohio. I like in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. Since the last time we uh, recorded a podcast here in Columbus, have you seen any further sights? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, St. Patrick's is a great church with lots of little nooks and crannies, yep. uh, which is beautiful. Yeah. So it's aesthetically pleasing to worship here and to dwell here, yeah. to be amongst these places. And even the brothers are quite nice, I found. The brothers. So, oh, yeah, the ones with whom, yeah, yeah, no, sure. uh -huh. quite, yeah. with whom we share a profession. That's right. If they weren't nice, would we be able to say it? Uh, possible, but why not? <laughs> uh -huh. um, okay, so... so we just finished a, a, you just gave a talk. Did um, I? You did. Okay. Um, is, it, is, is that going to be available to people? I think it's going to be available on Patreon. Okay, cool. otherwise it's going to be this cool David Foster Wallace thing. Exactly. So, uh, David Foster Wallace is, uh, for those who, who don't know, I'm not going to look at them, I guess. No, you can do whatever you oh, want. okay, hey. Um, so, David Foster Wallace is one of our favorite art, uh, writers, new American, 20th century uh, writer, fiction, writer and nonfiction, great yeah. nonfiction. And he wrote uh, a number of short stories. One of the collections is called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. And uh, it's just what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> but the trick about it is that he, it's a and a thing. It's interviews with hideous men. Um, but the questions are missing. So it just says Q and there's a blank. And then the guy answers. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how much you can fill in what the question is. Like you can go, you'd think this wouldn't work. Like mm -hmm. you, you usually have the question and you're supposed to fill in the answer. But this time you have the answer and you can already figure out what the question was. It's a genius. Yeah. So in a way, this is kind of like that. Like you might not have the lecture. So it's just, it's like brief interviews with a great Dominican. Okay. All right. All right. I'll take it. I was also thinking and reflecting on this as kind of personal sharing moment. Um, so you're kind of a poet, you know, I'm a, and I'm, I think I'm more of a painter, yeah, you know? So as I listen to you on these things, you're kind of a word smith. Uh, it's going to get you get caught up in the poetry of all the sort of thing. So a theological poet, maybe. Yeah. And I'm more of like a painter, like images, and I'm always trying to painter. philosophical painter. But then it goes deeper because Aristotle in his Poetics um, divides between two kinds of poetry. Uh -huh. And do you remember what those two kinds are? The kind yeah. of major two: the, the happy face, sad face. Um, tragedy, tragedy and comedy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I thought, you know what? That kind of maps too. Because when I listen to you and then like the Q&A, there's always like, it's, it's like deep depression and tragedy. Like, you know what this life is all about? It's about dragging your corpse through the mud when it's on fire. And then occasionally someone gives you a little bit to drink, but it's poisoned. Um, you know, and I mean, Grace shows up at the end, it's fine. It's kind yeah. of a Flannery O'Connor business sort yeah. of thing. But like, I think you're kind of like a theological tragic poet. Yeah. Whereas I always, I get uncomfortable with, with, with listening to you because one, it's beautiful. But two, I think like, I don't know. I mean, I, am I not just experiencing the Christian life? It's kind of, I'm happy. Like, <laughs> What's I, the I, like? You know, I kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a funny place and I find most things funny. And uh, yeah, it's the, I haven't dragged my corpse around in a while and we've been on fire. And, Maybe I'm just missing the cross. I always, I go to, I get secretly very worried that the Lord is like, nah. he's like saving it up. He's like, we'll see. I also, but I do suspect maybe that's just like, he knows I can't handle it. Whereas your, your body can, and spirit can handle this. Whereas for me, he's like, nah, give him the, give him the light feathered bed. Um, so yeah, so I'm a yeah, philosophical painter of comedy and theological yeah. poet of tragedy. Yeah, philosophical painter. All right, what are thoughts that that didn't? Well, what do you think genders. about that, fair? So my first thought is there's a Joni Mitchell song where she begins, I am a lonely painter, yeah. I live in a box of paints. Uh, so you might take that as a kind of theme song for your life. <laughs> Not a chance. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, Sounds it, it was worth it. The Blue Album is a great album. It's before she started smoking a billion packs of cigarettes a day. So She played, the, she played a little mini concert at St. Vincent Ferrer for Father Ken Latoyle when he was prior provincial. That's incredible. Yeah, because it was his favorite singer. And uh, oh Father Jack Devaney, another Dominican, knows some things and peoples, yeah. and I uh, got it arranged and stuff. And if you ask Father Ken, if you ever see Father Ken Latoyle, you can ask him. Ask him about his Joni favorite Mitchell. Canadian songstress. Yes. Um, okay, so apart from Joni Mitchell, um, my mom had a number of Joni Mitchell albums, so we would listen to the Blue Album, Ladies of the Canyon, and Court and Spark, so that's kind of like, those are formative moments for me. Yeah. Um, and my formative, I don't actually know what I'm saying. Um, but, uh, but, but, but when it comes to comedic 
Um, I, I think that one, one thing that you do is that you have patience with an image um, because I think I'm always rushing on. I'm like, come on guys, we're almost at the thing. And then people get to the thing and they're like, I am so breathless that I can't appreciate the thing because you've just been training a fire hose at my head for the past 40 minutes. Whereas, whereas yeah. by the time you get to your like fully conceived imagery, it's like, oh wow, I can appreciate that. I kind of got here, it was nice, it was a stroll, it wasn't the death march like that other guy had us pursue, so yeah, kudos. You're kind of a, yeah, you're kind of a bard and I'm kind of a bore, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so anyway, but second thing is, so I, got, yeah. I, I wrote down a bunch of things because it was exciting. I yeah. got excited, and then I like circled things, and I, wrote, I put highlighters on them, oh the things I have gosh. to talk about. You brought a highlighter to Columbus? Always highlighter. <laughs> <laughs> got to do that stuff. Anyway, so you mentioned at the start, you were telling a story about the kind of Protestants and as a boy and uh, works and all this, and you made what you th I think was a Freudian slash Ophelixian slip, um, because you said like you thought as a Catholic that you were about faith, but, oh no, sorry, sorry, yeah, Catholics were about works and this sort of thing. Yeah. But I thought, no way, man. I don't think that was wrong. I think, we'll put it this way, the Catholics' view of the sacraments is a non-works type of thing. It is, they're the sacraments of faith, whereas oftentimes a Protestant view of the sacraments, or lack thereof, is, ends up being kind of a works sort of thing. Hmm. So reflect for a second on, so on the sacraments as like the farthest things from works righteousness or like getting yourself into heaven, this kind of misconception. Because I think actually when you, when you weren't slipping on that, like mm -hmm. it, it, it is the case that at least on the Protestant side of things, oftentimes it was the reverse. This is a dialectic Hegelian point. But what you think is true is actually, sorry, that's two, but that was some of the talk. Um, <laughs> did I say today? Who knows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but sometimes when they say one thing, you actually, the truth is in the other thing. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like with the, the Catholic view of the sacraments, they're sacraments of faith, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get to in a minute. That's point five. Um, but talk about the sacraments versus like the works. Do you have any yeah. thought about like how Catholic sacraments are actually like, no, no, we're the really Protestant ones because we have not works righteousness. And that's what the sacraments give us. Yeah, that's okay. So my, my first thought is, um, you know how there are different editions of the catechism? So you had like the green edition, the St. Joseph edition, yep. and then you do white edition. That's the, the blue I call that the beach edition. The beach that's the edition. one you take to the beach. Exactly. And you're, and you're not upset if sand gets in between the pages. Yeah. Um, and then now you've got like the OSV editions and you've got the Ascension edition. So there are various editions of the catechism. But in the green edition, yep. there were pieces of art before each of the four sections. Ah, oh, number five. Nice. I anticipated it. Yeah, this pleases me. Um, so the catechism is divided into four main sections on the basis of Acts 432. I'm going to name it on the basis yeah. of God and reality. So it's, uh, you know, you have the creed, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the Christian moral life. Mm -hmm. And then you have like Christian liturgical worship. And then you, oh, I got the, the two and three confused. But moving on, then you have Christian prayer at the end. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the section that talks about the sacraments, mm -hmm. um, there's an image from the catacombs of the woman with the hemorrhage mm -hmm. laying hold of the edge of Jesus's garment. And um, so she had been stooped, uh, and she had expended all of her substance in seeking medical treatment, uh, but uh, it was only in touching the edge of Jesus' garment that the bleeding was dried up and that she uh, yeah. came back into possession of health and a kind of holiness. Um, so I think that there's a sense in which, like, the work is Christ's work, and I think that's the point of the sacraments. So if there is a work to be done, or if there is a work that has been done, it is Christ's work. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. in the sacraments, by showing up for them, intending and attending, we avail ourselves of Christ's work, or we kind of dispose ourselves, yeah. I suppose, to that work in a way that, um, yeah, makes us more perceptive of it and appreciative of it, so that we can treasure it and unpack it over the course of yeah. our lives. Well, I think it's, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the, the kind of, passivity of the sacraments for us you know um, baptism is like super passive mm. because you might not even be conscious really i mean you're conscious but not self-conscious to make that distinction um, um so you're just it's, it's being done unto you so it's like the farthest thing that works righteous as possible as far as i can imagine um and then the other sex is like confirmation i mean you don't want it so it's kind of the same passivity thing right because you're you know you're like eighth, eighth grade or something just get, get me out of here um and then the eucharist of course is something that like yeah if you're a priest, you're doing it, but even us, we're being used in Persona Christi, and the, the, the rest of us are, are worshiping and receiving. And then, of course, you know, orders, it's being done unto me, um, and then the anointing, right? I've done unto you. And the only one that, like, is not more or less passive is the wedding, where you are the 
you know, your exchange, you're the one who's doing the sacrament between the two, but it's passive in the sense that now you have this ball and a chain attached to you. And so you're like, you're receiving the cross. But there's still this, this manifest passivity involved, such that the sacraments are God, it's suffering God and his activity on you, as opposed to some sort of like working ourselves to the moral life. Like Catholics, we should really lean more into this, not to attack Protestants, but like we should, we should positively declare that we totally believe in God alone doing all the work. And that's why we believe in the sacraments, because we just want to sit in front of the Eucharist and let him work on us. You know, I, I agree. I also think that you have more of the tragic theologic poet in you than you're willing to admit. That's oh. nice, by the way. Yeah, because like at the end of the day, um, you know, while we as human beings are agents, right, and while life is not done unto us, life is for us, there is, you know, like a lot to be undergone in the sense that like there are two things each day that you can actually determine for yourself. It's like Chick-fil-A sauce or Polynesian sauce. And then, like, am I going to doom scroll for a minute or am I going to doom scroll for 100 minutes? Like, those are your choices. But, like, m most of the rest of your day is kind of set. It's like, oh, my alarm didn't go off. Fascinating. <laughs> didn't see that coming. You know, it's like, holy sm And then you just start off your day completely bewildered and bemused. I feel better rested and totally behind. Yeah. Um, right? There's just so much of human life which seems beyond our power, beyond our control, utterly beyond our ken. And then the question is, okay... What, what do I, like, our confidence, I know, whatever. I know. So I'm just practicing, know. I'm practicing. Okay, yeah, so, so then the question is, like, what do I do with that? And I think a lot of people spend their lives trying to control, right, trying to rein in, trying to dictate, you know, within the sphere of their competence. Whereas I think the Christian response is to say, like, you can abandon it because the force behind it all is benevolence, right? That sounds so Star Wars-y. Because it's from God, and it's for God. Because these are the terms, basically, of our relationship with him, which he's more motivated to bring about than we could ever possibly be, because our motivation amounts to, like, nothing plus a smidge. Here it is. Tragedy. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. That's great. Um, okay. So the anticipation, this is actually the third point. It was the next point. Nice. Okay, nice. Um, let me see. What's four? Are you going to anticipate that? We're going to find out. Yeah. Oh, I didn't label it. There it is. Oh, nah, probably not. Um, <laughs> it's a weird, creepy philosophical point. Jail awesome. um, Okay. So... I was thinking about this, the image, the, the art and the images in the catechism, um, because at JP2 Shrine in Washington, D.C., there's in the Luminous Mysteries Chapel, which has the, a vial of JP2's blood, St. John Paul II, and on, it has the mis Luminous Mysteries, but also has a bunch of other mosaics in there. And one of them is Christ meeting Mary in the garden, right? I mean, in the garden. And I initially mis mis mistook. Oh, yeah. I mistook um, this... This image for the, the hem incident of the, the, the woman who was, was bleeding and healed by Christ, which is the sacrament image in the green edition of the catechism. Because Christ is like, he's going like, moving his one arm away, and he's got this flowing kind of garment, and she's moving the other way, touching, holding the garment. And I thought, oh wait, that's, this is that image. But Christ has, um, he's in white, and he has his nail marks in. Mm. And I realized it was Mary in the garden. Now, this got me to think about dancing. Yep. Um, because the moves they were doing, they were, they were in dynamic motion. Yeah. And they got a sense of, they were, it looked like to me that they were dancing, they were moving with each other. And when Christ said, don't hold on to me, like stop touching me, which is the sacramental touch, it's not because he's like, hey, I've got to go do something else. Like here for a minute, okay, thanks, we had that, get out of here. But rather like, I can't stay here, you've got to come with me. Mm. And that gave me a, a sense of like what the sacraments are, like why they're still signs. This is all to say why I'm asking this question. Is like why still under the signs? And I got this sense that putting these two images together, like there's a bit of a chase in this life for God. Mm -hmm. It's like noli me tangere, like don't hold on to me, touch me, but you, we've got to keep moving. It's not a full embrace that we stay here. We're not meant for here. So I'm not going to come in this physicality here after the resurrection. I want you to chase after me going forward to this thing. So one of the reasons it seems to me that the signs, like why, why the signs? One of them, because it initiates this kind of chase dance move with him. Mm -hmm. And that we are always meant to be moving towards him further in and further up. But why do you think the, the yeah. why the signs? Why still keep with them? Yes, yeah, so the value the, of that. that. That's actually so. After the Second Vatican Council, there were like a number of debates hosted regarding uh, liturgical worship. So it's like uh, standing and kneeling in the early church during the Eucharistic anaphora, or like um, whether or not one should receive, 
you know, like on the tongue or on the hands, or like whether the Blessed Sacrament should be reserved in a tabernacle in the middle of the... Like all of these things were fought again because there was this um, kind of crisis of the understanding of tradition uh, as to like whether or not the church's teaching can mature or whether the church's practices can mature or whether we should always op like uh, opt for what's most ancient or like basically opt for what we want on the basis of some strange historical argument. Uh, but one of the things that actually came up in the course of these conversations it regards uh, just this point, the kind of dynamism of the sacraments, that we're always kind of in pursuit of the grace at the end of the line. Yeah. And that um, like signs are passing away, signs are meant to be ephemeral, mm -hmm. and that if we reify signs, we make of the sign the thing, then we have ourselves a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like a lot of people said as a result of this, that um, Eucharistic adoration was like not to be done, it was a minor part of the church's devotional life, that we had made too much of it. But, but it's, it's fascinating that like Eucharistic adoration has exploded in the last 75 years yeah. um, and that there's like a real hunger for it and thirst for it. Um, and that, that that corresponds with, you know, like liturgical changes after the Second Vatican Council. And people have made arguments as to how they're related. But I don't want to get into that as much right now because sure. blah, blah, blah. But, um, but, but what I think that you see is that, um, yeah, people are worried about reifying the Blessed Sacrament as if we were like hanging our hearts here and now in the gaze or in like the, the devotion. Whereas I think that this, what you just described, is even present even in Eucharistic adoration. Yeah. You know, like we're still being conducted into the fullness of the mystery because there's only one mystery, right? It's just Christ. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that like to receive him under signs is always going to be a little bit of a, a tantalizing yeah. or a little bit of a, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how you might describe it, nola tangerizing yeah. uh, phenomenon. It's a touching, not a hugging. It's Exactly. Yeah. It's a touching, not a hugging. Yeah. Because if we were to lay hold of it, and if we were to try to dictate the terms on which we experience it in the here and now, it, we would always find it slipping through our fingers or kind of yeah. passing through our grasp. I also think to tie it in, because um, you teach, you're, you're a dogmatician, but you teach morals. This, think about the, the, those two sections of the catechism. There's the moral life, and then mm -hmm. there's the sacraments. But actually, of course, they're they related. Like they're, the sacraments are a way of life, yeah. and I think it involves the sense of the life of faith as always chasing after Him and using the sacraments as these privileged moments, which we have frequently. Even you could even have every day uh, the Eucharist, and such that you order your life to live a sacramental kind of life. Do you have any thoughts and like the the way of the moral life as not like there's moral there's moral life we live in the virtues and blah blah blah. And then there's also the sacramental life thing that we do and pop in sometimes to the store. Yeah. No, instead, it should be an integrated, the moral life is for the sacramental life, the sacramental life is the moral life. They might be the same since the life of Christ and your moral yeah. life is the life of, of grace. What do you, what do you no, mean the sacraments as a way of life and not just like a thing that you do sometimes? Yes, I agree. Nice. Um, yeah. Okay, so next question. This is a point that you often make. Um, Ooh, that there's a... There's a tendency to think about our moral lives as just one part or one aspect of our humanity. It's like on the one hand, you know, you've got uh, temperance and fortitude and justice and prudence, and we're doing our best to live these virtues to the fullness or to the full. I suppose to the full, yeah. Um, and then on the other hand, it's like you might have some weird idiosyncrasies, or you might have like a nervous tick, or you might have bad oral hygiene, or you might be like one of those people who walks out of the bathroom with a little bit of toilet paper trailing from your right heel. But like, those aren't the moral life, you know? Mm -hmm. Those are just like something else. Oh yeah, Whereas, the Newtonian versus quantum mechanics analogy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this, you always make the point, like it's all the moral life yeah. because the moral life is just the human life and the human life is not only about living well, but it's also like living within the setting of a human community in which we are all meant to live well unto mm -hmm. the glory of God and salvation of souls or unto like the betterment of the polity. And so I, I think that like the, the, the difference between a kind of secular or a kind of natural approach to this and then a kind of sacred or supernatural approach to this is that the only way in we can the only way in which we can live a whole life, a full life in this register, in the divine, is by God's gift. Mm -hmm. And so the only way in which it's mediated to us is according to God's institution, yeah. which means through his Christ, in his church, by his sacraments. And so I think that the sacraments are just the way in which God begets a divine life in us and in the human community, in which that moral life then kind of 
issues or from which that moral life is meant to issue. So basically, like, it's not like, all right, we as Christians are doing our best to live a moral life and we like bop into the sacraments every once in a while because they're another compartment that we've been told to do, so they're on our moral checklist. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, it's the complete like opposite, or it's the complete reverse. Yeah. Because we're trying to live a life which is transfigured on a higher plane, and the only way we are able to see that, acknowledge that as a possibility, and then live that, which is to say, like, marshal the strength to do that, is by the sacramental life. Because the sacramental life is what furnishes us with the whole of our life in the supernatural realm. Yeah, I think this is a good point about the like preparation. So the sacraments we receive most frequently would be, I suppose, the Eucharist and confession. And the relationship between these two, such that preparing to receive the Eucharist is not by confessing our sins, going to confession beforehand on a frequent basis or whenever necessary in mortal sin, this kind of situation. This isn't like a one-off weird thing, but rather it's, it's something that we ought to do because we want to live well. Yeah. Like it's just, it's not a thing that church requires me once in a while. Or like the Sunday Mass obligations and those things, weird external requirement, but rather it's the church reminding us of the things we need to do to live well in the way of life, which includes the sacraments. Okay, uh, here's the theological. Uh, so you're a theologian, so I want you to kind of piece through this one. Because um, I don't, I, this one's always tricky. So we talked about the Eucharist. This is the Eucharist. And you might have come thinking we were going to talk about the Eucharistic like elements, quas, you know, the Eucharistic commun- and communion, Holy mm. Communion. Um, we were talking about the Eucharist as a sacrament and a sacrifice, the sign kind of stuff, of course. Um, and it's always struck me, and this is the, the kind of tension with liturgical, the liturgical act, this is the church's fault, it's not anyone else's, um, that the Mass is trying to do two very different days in one, right? So the Mass is trying to do Holy Thursday and Good Friday on the same day. Mm-hmm. It's trying to do Good Friday with the priest offering the sacrifice of the, cro- of the cross in its, under its sign, sacrifice value, blah, blah, blah. But it's also doing Holy Thursday, the sharing of communion, where communion, of course, was for instituted, all this kind of thing. Which Now, the trick is because humans, for maybe necessary reasons, have only one face. Um, it means that the priest is doing two different He's, one, asked, talking to the Father, but then, two, also communing on Thursday with the disciples. How do we hold, or how do you hold, as a theologian, in reflecting on the practice of this, the balance between the, the Eucharist as the sacrifice, as us pointing to God going there, and the Eucharist as receiving? Like, because sometimes it feels like there's two parts of the Mass. Like, we know we say the liturgy of the Word, the liturgy of the Eucharist. But in the liturgy of the Eucharist, it seems like there can be two parts. There's the the consecrated mass part, and then there's like the party gift part. There's the thing I get, Mm -hmm. right? So how do you bring together, um, since the signs have this sense of dynamic, you know, the eternal, how do you hold together um, the the sacrifice and the Holy Communion in in these, as opposed to being like schizophrenic with this? Yeah, so great question, thank you. Um, So I would say that we don't hold it together, Christ holds it together, in the sense that like, yeah, I know. Well, you had to, Um, I mean, I had to. So, so in the sense that, like, on Holy Thursday, our Lord gestures yes. towards Good Friday. No. Um, and, you know, we have different ways of understanding that. I think the Scott Hahn Four Cups explanation is beautiful in the sense that, like, it's, it's all part of a kind of Passover meal yeah, that's true. as it's celebrated in the Second yeah. Temple yeah. dispensation. But that, like, Good Friday is the consummation of yeah. Holy Thursday. Yes. Just, like, that it's intended, that it's foreseen, that it's foresuffered. Yeah. That, that, that's all present there. So, like, Christ is holding it together. Yeah. But I think one way in which we, you know, peons, with, with our limited philosophical and theological reasons, are able to understand and enter into the mystery is to think about Holy Thursday as the shape of the Mass, mm-hmm. and then to think about Good Friday as the content of the Mass. Oh, nice. yeah. um, in the sense that, like, you know, like, it's, it's within the setting of a kind of sacred meal, mm-hmm. right? But a sacred meal, so is a form of sacrifice. So what do we mean by sacrifice? Often our mind goes straight to, like, Holocaust, right? So an immolation. You had a host, you had a victim, and then that whole thing is just burned up. There's the blood and the fat, and then the whole of the victim. But, but in the more general acceptation, a sacrifice is just a change to a host. And that could be a benediction, that could be a meal, right? that could be an immolation of a certain sort. But basically, God changes a thing as a kind of manifestation of his sovereignty. We offer the thing to God to be changed. And the kind of shape of that is a sacred meal of a certain sort. Right? That doesn't mean that we're just here for table fellowship. It doesn't mean that we're just here to be on the same plane as God so that we can all recline on his breast as his beloved. But, but, but like, there, there's a change that taking, that's taking place within the setting of hospitality, fellowship, hilarity, delight, etc. But then the constant of that is God's gift of himself. 
Yeah. What you come to discover is that at the table, you are to partake of his body. You are to partake of his blood. And the only way in which to partake of his body and blood is if he is the one who changes them and suiting them to your reception. Yeah. And so God is offering the sacrifice of himself. But in order to appreciate what it is that you're actually partaking of, you have to look forward to Good Friday and then experience Good Friday. Yeah. And so it's like you have the Holy Thursday shape and you have the Good Friday content as God makes a change of him, you know, like God doesn't change in himself, makes a change of his assumed body as a way by which to offer up the power of his lifeblood to you. Mm -hmm. I like that shape content distinction. I like distinctions. Yeah, it's nice. Um, okay, it's great. So I think the one more, one question, more question than a, than a final, final question than MG. Nice. Um, okay, so... You talked about kind of sleeping with uh, in the chapel and going in there and sort of like having a sense of his presence. Um, and I like that because one Dominic used to do it, of course, you know. So this is a, man, this is a Dominican man here. Um, he used to like rest, lay his head on the, because he, he would do prayers, vigils in, the, in the, the church at night. Brothers would come up to him and say, Father Dominic, please, you must go to sleep. And he'd go, oh, okay. And they kind of wander and then wander back, and like, they find him in the morning, like laying in there. And if he, when he when he felt when he felt tired, he would go and lay his head on the tabernacle. So there's a sense of this beautiful kind of closeness to the Lord, um, which which you you imitate. I never do this. Um, so I'm like, man, no, I'll think about it. Um, but uh, I was thinking about I was immediately thrown into like intending. We talked about intending and the relating of this and faith, um, and then G. M. Scombe and some English philosophers. And I'll put it this way. Yeah. Um, it seems like, so faith in the Eucharist can be an act, uh -huh. right? So you act, you say, you look in the Eucharist and say, I believe. Like uh -huh. you act at that point, you make an act of faith and believing that even though it looks like still like the bread and wine, it is the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's like an act that I have to do. I have to attend to and act out. I have to... But there's also the capacity, of course, that everyone should be able to do this. There's no one we can't, you can't find someone who wouldn't be able to have it, make an act of faith. They might not contingently, because they don't know what the faith is, but they're all, we're all humans, we're all able to make this. But then between that is the, is the habit, the virtue of faith. Mm -hmm. So faith as like a settled disposition, and I think of that as like faith being a way of seeing, mm -hmm. such that you sh I think you should ideally, when you see like the Eucharist and monstrance, not have to like, oh, looks like bread again, act of faith yeah, yeah. sort of thing but rather as you as you spend more time with our lord and as you as you practice the faith just like as you speak a foreign language more often it becomes more habitual so you don't have to like switch to german now and okay now i'm going to speak german and this but you just it flows off i think in the same way there's a eucharistic faith which is a sort of habitual sense of when I drive past the church, I know he's in there. Mm -hmm. When I go into the adoration, I don't have to think that's him. I just know. I almost, I almost see it in that way. And it caught my attention with the going to pray with him because it's just like, a, where should I be right now? This sort of habitual kind of not like, got to reason it out. Let's see, in the house, who is the most important person? All right, Father James Sullivan, the prior. <laughs> Don't want to go sleep near him, because uh, that would, no, that's problematic. Let's see, okay, second most important person in the house, Jesus. Okay, yeah, he likes, he's okay when I sleep near him with the head, rest, head rested on his tabernacle, okay? So like there's this habitual sense, such that we get caught off guard if we're really being faithful, when someone says like, well, what do you mean? It's the body and blood. It's like, Don't you see it? Yeah. You know, so is that, Talk about the, the faith aspect as a virtue in the yeah. Eucharist, and not just as kind of a propositional, the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, even though it doesn't look like him anymore, um, but that rather it is in the, this habitual in, intending that we have that is a virtue and a habit as opposed to like an act or a capacity. Yeah, so I think that like the beloved asserts a kind of gravity. Um, and what I mean by this is like in your relationships, in your friendships, the ones that flow most naturally or that... Um, yeah, that, that like work most organically. It's not that you have to like try to love the other person. It's that you love to try kind of for the other person nice. in a certain sense. It's like if you see, you know, like the lover trying to love, it's kind of like, ooh, I'm your project. Back away slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you see the lover loving to try, it's kind of like, oh, that's awesome. You know, like I could crack the code for you and tell you, you know, what my two favorite restaurants are, so that way you can just get me Chick-fil-A gift cards for the rest of my life. But, like, I, I like to see the kind of 
uh, steady, mm -hmm. constant inquiry into my heart's desires so that you can, you know, in gaining access yeah. to them, you know, like respond to them. I think that's more, like, you see that in the love and you're like, oh man, I feel doubly beloved. Spontaneity. Uh -huh. You know, but there's like, in, in like, there, there's a kind of spontaneous element in every relationship where it's like the beloved asserts a kind of gravity and you find yourself tending unto the gra like tending unto the beloved without having to like work through the steps. Now, mind you, there's always going to be a little bit of work because we're dragging our flesh cages around. Um, but, but nevertheless, tragedy, yeah. yeah, exactly. Tragedy, tragic theological poetry. Um, but, but, but like with, with my, my experiences, like when I think about going down to the chapel, in part, it's like a, it's a habit in that I found it's a place in which I can finally get out of my head and into another, you know, because like with anxiety, the thing is you're trapped in your own head. You're just yeah. like locked between the walls of your brain. And it's just like, as, as things bounce back and forth, they attain to higher rates, which seems totally contrary to laws of friction, but it's just how it goes. But if you can get into the chapel, there's like a gravity that the beloved asserts and he kind of draws you out of yourself and into him. Yeah. And it's like, you don't perceive that. You know, like I'm not necessarily thinking like, Jesus, you are snuggly. Jesus, you are cuddly. I'm like sitting there thinking, Meh. you know, there's, it's just not coherent. But there's a way in which I'm being drawn out and in because I think that you can have that habitual tendency. And I think that's, that's just kind of what it means to right. Okay, um, one, this isn't a question. This is like me just spewing for a second because you caught my attention to this. Yeah, you good. raised a question about... Um, like the separate, it's the same sacrifice as the cross, but not the same sacrifice. And I thought, right, that's why I gave you the science in the workshop. Because if you need something to be the same yet different, what can be a vehicle for that? Signs. Because signs are similar. That's why they're signs of something, if they're natural signs. But they're not the same thing, yeah. of the same thing. They point to that other thing. So w this is why as Catholics, we should never give up on the sign, the importance of signs, the signification. Because it's the only way, only with signs, uh, of the sacrament, can you have both the same sacrifice, but not quite the same under a different mode? Because signs bring about the same thing in different ways. So signs are awesome. Well done, church. Okay. Um, so as we're closing here, so um, it's the end of the, the day of recollection, and um, people might want to go further and deeper, further in, further up. So do you have any recommendations for both the mind and you could say like the heart? So we'll do Franc Dominican and Franciscan. Like for, for thinking and for acting, mm -hmm. you know, for knowing and loving. Yeah. So do you have any, knowing might be like a book recommendation if people want to go think more about the Eucharist and loving might be like a particular practice yeah. that, you, that you recommend or maybe remind people to go know it again for the first time. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so my book recommendation, it's not too far off. In fact, oh, it yeah. is very close at hand. Ah, is seated. Anne Scarvanier's The Key to the Doctrine of the Eucharist or A Key to the Doctrine of the Eucharist which we read for a God's planning retreat, not this past summer, but the summer before, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great. Uh, super clear. I mean, I think it's probably pitched, um, yeah, closer to a graduate level than to an undergraduate level. But uh, it's the mm. type of thing that you can gain from, you know, you can comprehend something of. Because the point's not 100% comprehension. The point is encounter, you know, with the Lord God and uh, a deepened appreciation of his mysteries. So I found that super sweet. And yeah. he focuses a lot on this sign, value, peace. And then as to, okay, so, so something for the thought world and something for the body world. Um, as concerns the body world, um, I, you know, like I kind of go back and forth because I, I, I tend not to give many recommendations to mm -hmm. people because I find that you can rely upon the interior teacher to lead you in the way of all truth. And, yeah. and people sometimes feel overburdened by recommendations mm. like this priest told me that and that priest told me that and the other priest told me this. And it's like, sweet Christmas, how many of these things can I possibly do? Yeah. Um, so, so my kind of tendency is to think about deepening our experience rather than broadening our experience. Yep. And, and I think that um, what I found myself recommending to people more and more recently is to do less in your time before the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us feel a kind of anxiety of dead space. So it's like I am praying for 20 minutes maybe in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and I have this devotional, you know, I read the Magnificat readings for the day and then I pray, you know, three decades of a rosary and then I do all my prayers of petition and all my prayers of thanksgiving and that's 20. Um, my, my encouragement would be, yeah, don't, don't do all that, right? Not in the sense that those things are bad. Obviously, those things are good. But I think it's more important to try to be quiet in the presence of the mm, Blessed Sacrament yeah. and fail than to try to get done, like, various tasks in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and succeed. Yeah. I think it's more, impo like it's, it's more important that you fail at Tragedy. worthwhile endeavors yeah. um, and you fail in the right direction mm -hmm. than that you succeed or have the experience of success in a way that buffers you from the real depth of that encounter. Because I think that like, yeah, we're gonna be bored in the presence of the Lord, we're gonna be tired in the presence of the Lord, but I think we're gonna be 
ultimately like at home, at peace, in the presence of the Lord, but we have to afford him that space. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, falling forward is better than yeah, falling backwards or something. Good. Because uh, on your face. Falling upwards, shall yeah. still There you go. Really yeah. Interesting. Okay, so uh, I was going to, I didn't want to see that. I was just going to recommend the book too, but instead, so uh, that's great. Key doctrine, key to, a key to the doctrine of the Eucharist, which is sanctification. Uh, so I'm just going to recommend instead the Diary of St. Faustina. Nice! Which has nothing to do really with the sacrament No se, one saw that coming. Um, but, uh, but because, because I... You mean uh, to tell me that you like Because I Saint love St. Faustina. Faustina. So Father Gregory, my closest friend in the Order, gave me this. He knew ahead of time. Uh, gave me this in novitiate, this uh, relic of Faustina. I kept her in my, po in her in my pocket all these my years since being a novice. It was like, I don't know. I don't We're know like numbers. 14, now. 14 years, yeah. Um, occasionally she would wander away from me. Not for a long time. And I would lose her one time for like three weeks in a row. And I found her. And uh, it's bottom of my bed, just laying down. I probably fell out one day, whatever. Um, and, uh, or, or a mystery, who knows? <laughs> right, either, way, either way, she's back. Um, and so I was so excited. So I marched and had a little procession around the third floor hall, where I live now again as assistant student master. Um, but there, there's no talking there on that floor. So it's like a silent profession of me just wandering around a car doing this, you know? <laughs> so welcome to Creepsville. Um, but she's great. So yeah, read. Um, so I'm gonna say the most important book, yeah, St. Faustina's Diary, it's brilliant. Uh, you should read that and, and just love on her. She's great. Uh, most action, I would, yeah, I don't wanna give anyone an extra thing. But uh, if you haven't been to Eucharist Adoration in the last 27 years, you should go. Um, at least once in the next 30 years. Because uh, adoration, I re adoration was so important to me in growing in my faith after I become a, a Catholic, and I just stumbled upon this little all-night adoration chapel in Buffalo at St. Andrews in this little quiet place with snow, and I would just go in there after working at Barnes & Noble for about an hour and just sit in there and adore him and just sit in his presence and not do anything, really, uh, but just be present with him. I felt that was enough. Uh, and it was, I think, more than enough. Nothing I would have given him. There's a, a great French philosopher priest who says, oh, what's his name? Jean-Yves Lacoste. Um, he says, prayer is the raising of empty hands at the hour of evening sacrifice. It's the sense of, it's the raising of empty hands at the hour of evening sacrifice. It's that you don't have what you ought to have at this thing, but you raise them anyway because this is what you ought to do, and that is enough for him because he has provided this. So it's a sort of tragedy, but fulfilled. So, and that's what I think just sitting quiet at the Eucharist is, is, uh, is enough. It's raising empty hands, but he doesn't want anything else anyway. He's, he's happy to fill them. Okay, that's it. So, for all of you listening at home, on the road, amongst us, thanks for tuning in to this live-ish God's Plan episode <laughs> from Columbus, Ohio, St. Patrick's Church. Please visit this place. Also, visit our other site and like, subscribe. Leaves five-star reviews on Instagram, X, whatever social media platforms that you can find us and where that we are, whether it's 2024 or 2058. Depends how long this goes. <laughs> um, look on the website also for merchandise and for upcoming events, pilgrimages or whatever, tours. Uh, we'd love to see you at Malvern, PA, if this airs before that. <laughs> um, so check us out. Please know of our prayers for you. We'll be praying for you. We'll catch you next time on Godsplaining. Father Gregory. Tis I. How many goldfish did you have growing up? Um, I think like three. One mostly at state fairs. They didn't last too long, and I flushed them. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, <laughs> Godsplaining. <laughs>